the next morning we sat down and we just like wrote down what I expect of her and vice versa and which tasks in the household and in our relationship who's responsible for and taken care of and this took away 80% of the friction we ever had in our relationship it's not the critic who counts not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better the credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena whose face is marked by dust and sweat and blood Welcome to the Men in the Arena podcast, where we interview specialists in the realm of manhood. Each of our guests is an expert in their chosen field or cause as it relates to men. Our conviction is to call you into the arena of manhood, call you out of the faceless, nameless bleachers, and call you up to be the best version of you. Because when a man gets it, everyone wins. Enjoy today's episode. Men in the Arena Army. We salute you. Hey, guys, thanks for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, your host of today's show. Hey, guys, really excited about our guest today because he's an entrepreneur who helps other entrepreneurs find balance in life and especially the health of their marriage. And that's so important for us, guys. We need to have a healthy marriage. And I think this is this guy's got six steps that will really help you today. But guys, before we get into that, I want to talk to you about our man laws. Our man laws are supplied by you, our heroes. And when we use your man law, just hit us up at info at uh, Send us your physical address and we will shoot you some swag just to say thanks. And I was going through our man laws. We have like 50 total man laws. And I want to I want to get a hundred of these man laws compiled put them into a book. They'll be super fun. Uh, man, I was laughing last night when I went through this stuff, man, these are awesome, awesome man laws. The, this week's man law I had to laugh is from Francis. It just came in within the last week or two. And he calls this man law, the dad tax. The idea behind the dad tax is you teach your children about taxes by eating 20% of their ice creams or any dessert for that matter. And, and so if your kids are eating something sweet, it's not unusual for you as a parent under the dad tax uh, mandate to have 20% of that snack. So uh, you're teaching your kids economics and you're teaching them uh, about sharing and you're uh, receiving a little bit of love from them in the process. So uh, thanks a lot, Francis, for that. That is awesome. So we appreciate that so much. Hit us up and we want to send you some swag. Also, guys, I want to share with you our hero story this week. It's from Todd, and Todd wrote this. So guys, remember, send these hero stories because you are our heroes. We really want to hear from you. Todd says, thank you for tackling the tough subjects. I just discovered this podcast and have been binge listening many episodes. The May 12th podcast with Pastor Broom, he's an ex-porn star, guys, hit home as it applies to my struggle with porn. Some of his comments were very freeing. I will be working towards purity as I can't help but think of his words as he described the industry and how miserable he was involved in the industry. His words, quote, you are not who your worst thoughts or deeds are, and you are not as good as your best. Really hit home and help me process the cycle of sin, repent, sin, repent. Thanks again for being real, Todd. So Todd, hit us up, man. We sure appreciate that. Again, guys, when we use your stuff on our show, hit us up at info at so we can send you some swag. So guys, Thank you for making the Men in the Arena podcast Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. So, guys, thank you again for making the Men in the Arena podcast Spotify's number one podcast for Christian men. Guys, I'm really excited about our guest today, David Hensel. He's 44 years old, lives in Bodrum, Turkey. He's got the sweetest accent. You're going to love it. Anyway, <laughs> he's been married to his beautiful wife, Yurta. Did I say that right, Yurta? You pronounce this correctly, yes. Okay, he's been married to his beautiful wife, Yurta, for 17 years. David is the CEO of UpCoach and has been an entrepreneur for over 20 years. His passion is to help individuals and their organization reach their full potential. And aside from UpCoach, he has a portfolio of companies and his passion project, Managing Happiness, is what we're really excited about today. He helps entrepreneurs and their marriages, among many, many other things. So we're excited to have him on today. David, thank you so much for coming on all the way from Turkey. Thank you very much for having me. I'm actually in Germany today where I'm from originally. But yeah, I live in Turkey most of the year. Okay, so uh, so how's the weather in Germany? I know you don't love the weather over there, but summertime. <laughs> yeah, it's summertime. This is why I'm, uh, I can stand being here for a while. No, jo jo all joking <laughs> aside, you know, from time to time, I come and visit family um, and yeah. That's what I'm doing. Right uh, what, what part of Germany are you from? We're in Wiesbaden, close to Frankfurt. 
Oh, wow. Okay, great. Well, mate, man, it's great to have you on the show. And hey, let's start off with this, man. Tell us a little bit about your story. We know you're a serial entrepreneur. I, I like to call him that. Uh, what do we need to know about you? Give us some background. So as you already know, I'm from Germany originally. I've always been an entrepreneur. I uh, went to 14 different schools and I got kicked out everywhere. I was a real trouble student <laughs> and kid. And, you know, with I was pretty extreme. My teenage years, I smoked a pack of cigarettes a day when I was 12 and I was drinking like around the same time. And uh, wow. with 15, I started smoking weed every day, like 20 joints type of thing. Like it was, was really, really wow. intense. And I was kind of lost. And at some point I got tired of the party lifestyle and, you know, felt like smoking weed is the handbrake in life. And so I decided mm -hmm. to make a change and uh, want to, you know, I, I actually went to the Arbeitsamt, which is like a job center in Germany and then read through every possible job that I could do. And I thought, this is all horrible. I do not want to do any of this. And I was kind of depressed and lost. And then a friend of mine um, said like, hey, you will put computers. How about you? We start the business together. And then I found entrepreneurship and this was like really my thing because I could, you know, I could just do my thing. And um, then I had this, this IT business here in, in Germany. Then I had an e-commerce business in Germany, which I sold, which gave me the money to get my investor visa to move to the United States. Cause I always want to go to the States. I had really good friends there and the startup scene in the early 2000s was like not really existent in Germany and in the U S mm -hmm. it was pumping. I was like, okay, this is where I want to be. So I moved to Los Angeles and I co-founded Max CDN, the content delivery network, which wow. we sold uh, like in 2016 or so. I had a really good exit. And you know, for, for context, since, you know, this, um, I, my wife went through breast cancer. Knock on wood, she's doing great oh. today. But this was a, oh, a wow. big this, uh, she, She's absolutely great. Yeah, so uh, it's like all the follow-ups. And so thank God everything things good. Yeah. But this was a big wake-up moment for me. Because, you know, I, I kind of envisioned myself laying on my deathbed, looking back at my life, thinking, did I really do what I was supposed to do? Did I have the impact I mm. want to have? And, um, you know, kind of like thinking about my, you know, did I really live a life that I want to live in? Back then, my business was was great. It was growing. It was fun. But it did not has it didn't, didn't have a, as much impact I want to have. So I talked to my business partners and we sold the business. And I kind of went on a soul-searching journey on like what can i do to have positive impact mm. and something that my wife and i had implemented um, that worked really well was applying business principles to family life i'm um, i was always a personal development and an entrepreneurial uh, and organizational development geek and so one day i came home after a long meeting about roles and responsibilities in my business and my wife was sitting on the couch at home and my daughter as well and my daughter had a full diaper and said like hey honey look emma has a full diaper and this really triggered my wife and she got really upset at me. Uh, and because she, to her, it sounded like I'm pointing out to her, like, hey, just like clean the diaper, which was not my intention. I was just tired. I was like, hey, look. But, and then I thought, why do we fight about this? You know, she, she changed mm. the diaper most of the time, you know, 90% of the time because I'm not home that often. And I have no problem doing it. You know, it's really no issue. But I didn't realize, that, okay, it's my turn. I didn't realize that it would be my turn at a Tuesday evening at 9 p.m. or whatever. And then I realized like, hey, we never talked about the roles and responsibilities in our lives. Uh, same mm. as we do in business, you know, we never did this in our, in our household. And the next morning we sat down and we just like wrote down what do I expect of her and vice versa and which tasks in the household and in our relationship does who's, who's responsible for and taken care of. And this took away 80% of the friction we ever had in our relationship. It was like absolutely magical. Wow. You know, like who, who puts a daughter to bed, who brings her to school, who's like kind of all these things made it so much easier, especially with, you know, <laughs> Uh, before we had it clear, like who gets up to feed our dog or to when, when the baby's crying, uh -huh. you know, I was kind of like laying there, waking up from it, thinking like, oh my God, I hope she gets up. I hope she gets up. And kind of like in this process, I got so awake that, you know, I couldn't fall back asleep, you know, even if she got up then. Um, so kind of just like having these clear roles and responsibilities just like takes away up so much frustration, you know, in your business and, and, and also in, in your private life. And once I had this, I thought like, hey, if this works so well, maybe we take other aspects of business and apply it to our personal lives, like having regular meetings, having a shared calendar, having a shared to-do list, you know, kind of all these things you do in business, having a mission and a vision for you and, and having clear goals for your private life as well. Uh, all the stuff that works really well in business because people have spent gazillions of dollars to optimize businesses 
And a business is just a group of people that are aligned, have a common goal. Um, and you know, all these things we do in business is to make this smooth and make this group of people successful. And the family is also just a group of people. And so, you know, I, I created a course called Managing Happiness and Applying Business Principles to Family Life. And this worked really well for us. So, well, you know, that's really interesting, David, because I work with, so my kids would call me an entrepreneur. I, I founded a nonprofit organization for men, and we've got two other uh, organizations that we're working with uh, outside of that. But one of the things I've noticed is that a lot of very successful businessmen who are leaders, uh, they're just, they know how to get it done in the workforce. They're passive and weak and apathetic husbands and fathers. And so I think you're onto something, but I, and I want to dive headlong into that in a, just a couple minutes here. But first, I'm curious about UpCoach. What is UpCoach and how does that work? So, I, I, so our guys are listening and, and this might be something our guys really need. What is this? So UpCoach is one of my businesses, one of the um, yeah, businesses in my portfolio. And I always, <clears throat> I like to scratch my own itch when I have a problem in business. I like to Absolutely. build a business around that, that, that fixes that. And first I had this online course and I had a very low completion rate on my course, which really drove me nuts because for me it was like more about having impact. And so I ended up um, switching from only having a course that people take by themselves to group based coaching. And this worked absolutely phenomenal, but I had to cobble it together with lots of different tools, like with Google docs, with WhatsApp, with, you know, just like was a bunch of tools cobbled together. And it was not a good experience mm -hmm. for the user. And also was for me from an administrative standpoint, it was like, very yeah, you know, not good. So I asked the CTO of one of my businesses to build me a group habit tracker because I'm big on habits. I think habits determine everything in your life. So if you're rich or poor, or happy or unhappy, obese or in shape, it all boils down to which habits Absolutely. you cultivate in your life. You know, so I'm a total habits nerd. That's also a big part of managing happiness to really dial your habits in. You know, eliminate the bad ones and and uh, focus on the good ones. And so yeah, we started to add more and more features to this, and at some point, it turned out to be a really good software for group-based coaching and also for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I reached out to Todd Herman, who wrote The Alter Ego Effect, um, you know, New York Times bestseller. And he's like a rock star mm -hmm. coach being in the industry for 20 plus years. And I showed him, so I came and I built this coaching software, even though I'm not a really, I'm, I'm not a real coach by trade. And he said, like, this solves 80% of my business problems. I want to invest and become a business partner. So this ended up being another uh, another business which is 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 go, growing very well. It's also very close to my heart because my personal mission is to be a change agent who's transforming the lives of individuals and organizations. And you know, this is like leverage for that because like I can empower thousands of coaches to you know help millions of people. So it's kind of like this is why I'm, I'm very passionate about this. So yeah, that's our coach. You know, that's really funny when I interview different guys. We've had over 500 interviews for this ep this podcast. It's funny how similar many of us are. You know, I built a mission state when I was 32 years old and I'm 56 now and it hasn't really changed. And it really has been a compass for my life. And then I built a mission statement for our family. And it really had, which the mission statement for us encompasses five values that we try to live by. And it's really interesting how this works. And so, you know, you talked about scratching your own itch. And I, I just, guys, listen. That is great advice from David. If you have something going on, scratch your own itch. Look at your life. So David, speaking of scratching your own itch, on your website, you said this, and I had to laugh because your website, um, a lot of times websites are kind of self-gratifying and, oh, I'm this awesome guy. And, and, and you know, your website's solid, but, but you said something I don't usually see on a website, which I thought it was worth quoting because it impressed me. Okay, so here it is. You said, I've been, and, we're, and I want you to talk to me about this quote. You said, I've been bootstrapping businesses for the past 20 years, and I must admit, it's been an amazing ride. I've done a lot of things and have learned even more from the things I effed up. <laughs> I thought, man, you know, entrepreneurs sometimes have a hard time admitting that, but talk, talk to us about this statement, uh, learning from the things you've effed up and scratching your own itch. Well, it's... Part of building a business is, you know, I guess fail stands for first attempt and learning, right? And mm. it's just like, you know, just have to get up again and and attempt again. And 
learn from the stuff that you know why didn't it work what can i do differently kind of like self-reflect mm -hmm. you know i think that's you know um actually another thing in my businesses and in my personal life i have an error log so every time something doesn't work customer complaints we don't deliver on time whatever it is we add this to the error log and then uh, we also write what can we do to make sure this never happens again which standard operating procedure can we adjust to make sure this never happens again? Same in my private life. If something doesn't go according to my plan, if I fall off the wagon of like sticking to one of my good habits, I reflect, what can I do to make sure this doesn't happen again? You know, for example, eating late at night, eating crap, you know, just like making sure you don't not buy it or not getting up in the morning and sticking to my morning routine. The solution is like charge your phone outside. Don't use your phone before you, are done with your morning routine, etc. So I think this is like a really big thing to always reflect on the things that do not work and learn mm -hmm. and grow from them. And scratching your own itch, you know, I always like to, yeah, I, I love building businesses and I think scratching your own itch, like if you look for a solution, you can't really find one. For example, we just launched a new product. It's called UberQA. It's quality assurance for web developers or for developers. And we had a company that was doing this for us that we hired and they were just like doing a poor job. So we thought, okay, we can do this better. And, you know, we built a business around that. So if you're looking for business ideas, if you're in the industry, you really understand the industry and there's like an itch that you have something that is not there, that's probably a good starting point too. Well, it's really interesting, David. I was uh, having a, I was at a speaking event this weekend and uh, I had my son come down to help sell some stuff from our display. But as we we're driving around that day, He's he's a really a brilliant young man. He's 26 years old. He's already bought two homes with on his own, no help. <clears throat> and he was saying, Dad, I, I'm not happy with my career. Uh, I need to find, I need to look for something different. I'm like, son, scratch your own itch. <laughs> I literally said that. What do you love to do? What? And he goes, I love to buy houses. And I go, well, then why don't you become a realtor? You know what I mean? So this is what <clears throat> young men sometimes don't understand. Man, you don't have to have a dead end job that you hate find something that you love to do and build your career around it you know and because you have a passion for this thing so this this is that that entrepreneurial spirit you said this uh I, i'm quoting you from your website <clears throat> you said as an entrepreneur and i think this is a big problem with entrepreneurs and i think this is where your managing happiness comes in so i want to camp on that for the next uh, 35 minutes or so you said as an entrepreneur, balancing my personal and professional life was a challenging task. But over the years, my wife and I perfected a system that allows us to lead a happy and familiar, a happy and fulfilling marriage while running a startup. So I don't know about you, but I get this thing called uh, Tim Ferriss calls it monkey mind, where your mind never shuts off. Right? You're always thinking about this. So, so how how do you create balance in the midst of being a serial entrepreneur because i mean you're doing this stuff and you're thinking about it all the time and you still have to come home and raise a family and love your wife how do you shut it off how do you find that balance man oh there's it's um there's not only like one thing there's just like a lot of yeah. little things that that's um helping with that one thing for example i have in my calendar everything's blocked i'm big on time blocking in my calendar so i have like yeah. you know i have like me time where i work out in the morning and i have family time in the evening i have a lunch blocked out and you know all my meetings are blocked out so that's like like a big thing that i actually schedule family time you know or planning family time or planning vacations ahead of time you know it's like you know are you so you was just like i used to only go on vacation when my wife was losing it saying like hey we haven't been anywhere forever and then i you know just like knee-jerk reaction book something which you know then i overpay for it's not properly researched and a lot of projects go south because i just like reschedule stuff in my council which was, it was never a good thing so now I just like always plan ahead and do this up front and i think it really helps me to only use calendly which is like a, a service where you can just like book appointments um uh, based on the available in your calendar because like if you tell me like hey david let's jump on podcast and you suggest 3 a.m my time or like sure or you suggest it during family time I'm like sure you know because like i don't know something's broken in my head um but <laughs> if i you know so i basically use calendly to protect myself from from doing these things right um and yeah i think like scheduling family time is, is a really big one and then kind of like having a clear 
mission and vision statement for the most important areas of your life. So I, I have it for the role for myself, you know, my mind, body, and spirit. Then for me as the professional, and then also for me as the, the family man, you know, so kind of like really having clear goals and um, yeah, I think this uh, and the vision and the mission and living up to this and communicating this with your family. So your family can also hold you accountable if you're not living up to these things. Another thing that's absolutely amazing, um, that a buddy of mine, Dan Martel, um, pointed this out to me. Um, it's called um, family board meetings. And family board meetings are similar to a board meeting they have in your business. Um, you go I, with my daughter, who's eight. She Every quarter. Oh, you have it? Yeah. That's what's yeah, up. Yeah, he's coming on my it. podcast. This, yeah. this is so good. It is absolutely amazing. So, for those of you who have not read the book, um, the idea is every quarter you you meet with your kid or with, with your wife, but only one on one time. It's minimum four hours, ideally an entire day. No technology, no iPhones, no movies, no nothing. You do something together. And I always ask my daughter, what do you want to do? And she writes a list of things you want she wants to do. And it's always so cool and so much fun. So I can really recommend that you do this. And, which kind of brings you to the point of it's not about how much time you spend with your kids. It's about the quality time that you spend with them. You know, so coming home, I would always used to come home, like still being on my phone, on Slack and like, blah, blah, and kind of like just being physically present, but not mentally, not really like playing with her mm -hmm. or just kind of like going, going all in. And this is also a big friction point with my wife. She always complained about that, that I'm home, but I'm not home. I'm still like in, in the office. Yeah. Yep. And the and in our family meetings, we always have, you know, this um sh we have we have this part of the family meeting where she calls out things that are annoying to her and vice versa. And then we pick one and we fix them, you know. So for example, the not being present at home, we fix by I always thought, okay, something's going on in the business and they need me to do whatever. So we um came up with this thing. I put my phone on mute, I charge it, put it away. And we got a, a landline that people can call me in case something really happens, you know. And you know, this phone never rang in its entire existence, you know. So, um, yeah, just uh, if you do this with, with if this is your issue, just do the same thing. Put your phone on silent, charge it, and give people in the office your wife's phone so they can call you or like your landline. And this really helped us tremendously. Well, there's so much to what you're saying here, man. And I've just come off of a four, a four week extended kind of vacation because I had allowed my life to get out of order and the things I have written in my mission statement, those values I had allowed to kind of, kind of move down to the bottom and reclaiming the morning schedule. And so I want to just go back to what you said. And I think this is so important. You know, when we read the Bible, we see that Jesus blocked time in his schedule to pray. And I think this blocks of time blocks of time is super important that guys block time off. And I don't know about you, but I do it in the morning. The big things for me are the, the things I block that are the most important are generally in the morning things I do every day, right? I, I get up, I make my coffee, <laughs> read my Bible, pray, read a book, read to Shanna, you know, the big things work out. So these are the big things. And I think this is really, really good. So I hope I'm hoping that our guys are hearing what you're saying here, but I want to move on to uh, this marriage component because I think this is a massive issue. And we've, this is a, we, we know it's a massive issue when about half of marriages end in divorce and you have this thing called managing happiness, your managing happiness project. Uh, you wrote this, Hey, it's important that you're always on your a game and that you take care of yourself. By crafting your mission statement, you will have clear understanding of what you want in life. You will also learn how to become emotionally strong. And so I want to, I want you to walk us through these six things that you teach about having a successful marriage. And the first thing is managing yourself, which you've already hit on that, but do you want to add anything more to managing yourself? I mean, I think self-mastery is like always um, the most important thing that, um, if you want to be a good leader, you have to kind of start with leading yourself properly. Yeah, right? and absolutely. And, and I alluded to this before, I talked about this before, habits, I think, are a key component. You know, you really mm -hmm. watch what you do on, on a regular basis because the habits determine everything in your life. If you're 
successful or not, happy or not, um, fit or not, or have a happy marriage or not. Um, I think that's like a really key thing to really write down the habits and track them. You know, business one-on-one, what you measure will improve. So track it on a regular basis, get a habit tracker and and, and track these things. Um, what do you mean a habit tracker? What is What do you mean by habit tracker? A habit tracker or software where you check off that reminds you, you know, like you kind of write down the habits that you want to cultivate and then you check them off every day. You know, for example, I have three. Oh, I have a lot of, okay. I have a lot of habits, but there's like three main habits that I want to do every day. Um, the first one is exercise. I want to sweat every day because this just, mm-hmm. it's good for, it's good for health, but it's also really good for our heads because mm-hmm. it de-stresses you and it makes you, makes you much happier. You know, bef- back in the days when, there was stress. We had to either was fight or flight. We had to fight the saber tooth tiger or run away from the saber tooth tiger. And while doing this, we get rid of the negative stuff in in, in our body that 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 stress um um causes. And these mm-hmm. days, we get stressed by an email, and we still sit in a desk. You know, so um, yep, so I think it's, sure. it's really important to to work out every day. The second thing is plan the next day. Every evening I sit down and plan the next day because I never want to drop the ball on anything and I want to hit the ground running the next morning. So just like spelling out what are my tasks. And then I always circle the frog. Cool book, Eating the Frog. The concept is um, we tend to procrastinate on the most important things. And often the thing you really do not want to do is the most important thing. Think back childhood days, you have to do homework and you're... Uh, start cleaning up your room, even though it's not really important, you know? So I always kind of pick the task where I think like, I really don't want to do this and do this first. Cause then this gives me an energy boost versus if I'm not doing it and I procrastinate on it sits in the back of my mind, it grows and it eats up my mental resources and stuff. And, you know, procrastination is being an a-hole to your future self. So please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Say that again. That's going to go on. I'm tweeting that. Say that again. <laughs> Procrastination is being an asshole to your future self. Sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so good. <laughs> that is so true. You know, it's funny. I I switched back over uh, this week. Actually, I switched back over to working out in the mornings. I work out. I, I like the Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan would say, "I owe my body this much." So I owe my body four to five workouts a week. But I negotiate those workouts all the way till about three or four every afternoon. And I'm like, this is killing me. I'm wasted because I know it's going to hurt, right? I know it's going to hurt. And so I'm like, I decided I, I'm going to go back to the morning stuff. So I've been doing, getting on the Peloton or right now I'm training for elk season. So I'm hiking four miles with a 60 pound sandbag on my back. And I'm going to upgrade that to a hundred, two sixty pounders. I hope I don't die, oh. but, <laughs> but I mean, I'm having to force myself to do it in the morning and statistics or science tells us that when you do that in the morning, you get 30% more energy throughout the day because your body responds to that. And so that is so good, man. I think you, you said, I think our habits define us. Well, the habits think? are the only, only way to predict your future. Your habits will predict your future. It's the only yes. way we have to, to do that. Right. And yeah, Gosh, it, that it's is so, so good. That is so good. So, so you're talking about six things and managing happiness specifically regarding your marriage. And I want to emphasize this guys, the number one thing you can do is manage yourself because if you are a train wreck, how can you ever, <laughs> I had a guy, I spoke at this event down in uh, Southern Oregon and I had a guy afterwards was weeping because his marriage is he's destroyed his marriage because of his own poor decisions. And and we have to start with ourselves. If we want to build a healthy marriage, we have to become healthy. So, so good, man. That is so good. So part two of this six part series is uh, asking yourself this question, what do you want your life to look like? And so you said that this will set you up for a harmonious and aligned relationship. And so what, so what is that? When you, when you use the phrase harmonious relationship, what does that mean and why is harmony within the relationship so vital? I mean, you want, if something's not harmonious, it's not, it's not, it's like a machine that's not humming, you know, it's there, mm-hmm, there, there mm-hmm, are issues. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it's, it's important to communicate what do you really want, you know, kind of like to really understand what are the things that you want. Actually, it's really important what are the things that you want, not what society tells you that you should want or what your parents tell you. We have this uh, exercise of doing a vision board in managing happiness. 
And one of the participants put like this supercar in the center of his vision board. And like four weeks, four weeks in, he says like, I don't know why I did this. I don't even like cars, you know, but it's like <laughs> kind of like how we're kind of stuck with this. And doing a, a bucket list, for example, doing this with, you do a bucket list and your spouse does her bucket list. And then you kind of combine them or kind of look, look at them. It's really interesting what you find out. For example, I found out my, my wife always wants to be a carpenter. It's like, holy cow, like seriously? You know, as like, and her, her, you know, <laughs> Tur- Turkish family and her, her father was like, no, this is not a girl's job. You're, you're not doing this. And um, I would have never known if we would not have done this exercise. And now I um, gave her the funds to start a business. And she has like a, a business in Turkey that builds t- a frames and tiny houses and like, you know, woodwork stuff. You know, she, she doesn't do the work herself, but she has like the teams that, that do that, you know? So, it's wow. kind of, you know, so I think it's, it's so important to kind of really figure out what do you really want? Same thing with my, uh, when I was, had this, imagining myself laying on my deathbed, looking back at my life. I think yeah. it's so important to know what you want. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, really good book. He talks about the funeral exercise. You yeah. Imagine your own funeral and then people give a eulogy about you. What do you want to say? You know, what would make you the most proud? And then once you understand this, then you can work backwards. And, you know, because like an architect, when they build a house, they see the house in their, in their mind and then they work backwards towards like, what do I have to do to get to this end result? So I think it's absolutely crucial to know what you want so you can work towards it because I think this is like, this defines happiness to know what you want and work towards getting it and always growing and expanding. Because if you, you know, if you're not growing anymore, if, if a tree is not growing anymore, it's dying. If a business is not growing anymore, mm-hmm. it's dying. If a relationship is not growing anymore, it becomes stale and old and like falls apart. Same as you. If you're not growing anymore, it's, yeah, you're kind of on your way out. I, I'm loving what you're saying, David. This is so good. Um, about 25 years ago, I wrote a thousand word as a uh, eulogy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we call this reverse engineering. So you go to the end of the project and reverse backwards. So, so guys, what do you want your life to look like? Write it down, write your own eulogy, write your epitaph. What one sentence is your family going to say about you on your tombstone? This will be so good. You said this, uh, this is a quote from uh, regarding this part two, which is what do you want your life to look like? And you said in this part, you'll create and define the foundation of your relationship. You'll craft your family core values, your rules of engagement, figure out what you both want out of life and your relationship. And so I'm a licensed prepare and rich marriage and uh, counselor and pre-marriage counselor. And the whole test, David, is built on uh, harmony. In other words, there are 10 key areas in your life, in your marriage. And do you agree in these things? You know, do you agree politically? Do you agree spiritually? Do you agree with your same health values. And so they found over and over again, they found that couples that are the most harmonious have the best relationship. Yes. And and core core values, some kind of what do you want? Like, oh, I want 10 children. No, I do not want children. It's it's important to figure this out as early as possible. One person who took the course back then was just still an email, uh, like a a do-it-yourself online course. She wrote me, thank you so much for this course. I just took it and I realized me and my fiance are our values are completely not aligned. And I just end the relationship. I'm like, ah, this was not my intention. You actually want to help people. I think I really helped them because like, they would just like, have, you did help her, you know, m- miserable time later on, you know, being just like wanting different things. Well, I'll tell life. you what, I, I'll tell you what, I, at least here in America, man, if, if you're in love with a woman guy and you don't align politically break up, if you don't align spiritually, if she's like Buddhist and you're like Jewish or something, you know, get out of there because listen, it's going to hurt. But on the course of your life, you're going to have a real hard time if your values do not align. So what you're saying here, David, I want to emphasize how important it is. This is so good, man. Hey, David, so so when we're looking at this harmonious relationship, we're looking at, uh, you know, values that align. What, what are your thoughts on spiritual values? Have you seen anything there or experienced anything firsthand? So in terms of spiritual values, I've. Let me take a lot of steps back because I've had a very broad exposure to different religions. My father and a friend brought Shambhala, which is a Buddhist religion, a flavor of a Buddhist religion. They brought this to Europe and they started the first temple there. So like the first years of my life, I was living in this Buddhist temple, you know, so I had to expose mm. this religion. 
my mother was Roman Catholic and I was an altar boy. I was also lead. I was at some point, I was also lead altar boy in, in the church. So wow. like this, this exposure there. Then, as I told you before, I turned like 15 or so, uh, I just became a like extreme, extreme wild child. Um, and later I met my wife who is Turkish and I converted to Islam and I lived Islam straight for seven years, like really the whole, wow. you know, and, um, and then I moved to LA and I became more spiritual. Kind of l looking back, I think all these religions have, like, if you really boil it down very to the, the essence of it, the messages make decisions out of love and not fear. Kind of what Jesus said, you know, it's just really about like acting out of love. If you act out of love, you're on the right path. Also, if you if you follow your religion out of love for God, of love for people, you're it's a much stronger thing than versus just like out of fear because oh i don't want to end, end up in hell you know so i think like if you really boil the religions down it's the essence of making decisions of love and not fear and i want to tell you something that you know was so eye-opening to me actually where i have this this from i used to be very introverted i'm a recovering introvert really yes <clears throat> and okay it was um you know i was even uncomfortable on the conference call i was uncomfortable holding meetings with my 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 own team my people like standing in front of them was like made me super uncomfortable was was really holding me back in, in business and in life and i saw a friend of mine crush it with networking and speaking at conferences and i thought like okay i want that you know so but how do i get there so i did toastmasters twice a week um oh wow toastmasters are like public speaking courses yep, it's really cool yep, actually yep. it's fun and very low cost so if you want to improve your public speaking check out toastmasters and I went to two networking events per week, uh, just like exposure therapy, hardcore to kind of overcome this shyness that I had, right? And it worked, but the real transformation happened when my yoga teacher said, every decision in life, you either make out of love or out of fear. And I was like, holy cow, this makes so much sense. I really knew this deep down inside of me, but now she gave me this framework to articulate this and to use this as a, as a mantra or something that I basically based all my decisions off. I hated sales as well. I used to hate sales for the passion. And I couldn't sell. I always felt like a used car salesman, you know, selling something like, oh, because we have to hit our numbers. We have to have to pay my mortgage. It was like the motivation for selling. And it was like really hard for me. But now knowing this concept of love, not fear, if I sell something and I'm like, dude, this is going to really help you in your life, in your business, then I can even be a pushy sales guy because I'm selling out of love because I want to enrich your life. Or public yep, speaking or like exactly. being on this podcast. You know, I would have never done this before because I was always full of fear. Do they think I have a weird German accent? Do they think I look weird? Do they think what I'm saying is stupid? And I could not present. But if I'm, because I'm full of fear, but if I do this for somebody else, I do it for out of love because what I can share here can help them in your life, in their lives and their businesses. It becomes very easy for me to do a presentation. So it's become like, and I could like give you, or in relationships, my wife, always ask me to do stuff around the house. Like, hey, could you please hang this up? Could you please put together this piece of furniture or whatever? Could you fix this? And I always, I hate this stuff with a passion. I prefer to do my taxes over this. And I only did this out of fear because I didn't want to have conflict with her. And then when I'm doing this task out of fear, I hate the process. I hate the task. And the end result is not really good because I'm not doing it with love. And um, now that I know this concept, I still start out of fear, but then I, because I don't like it, but then I switch to love to make my wife happy and to make our house nicer. And all of a sudden, it it's it's fun. I enjoy doing it because, yeah, it's just like the, the mindset that you have has such an extreme impact in, in what you're doing. I could go on and on, on but, but yeah, that's... No, I really like that. First of all, your religious experience, holy crap. I grew up in Southern California, so I understand what you mean by spiritual, <laughs> but it's just, it's just so interesting, uh, your story. And I, I do think, you know, the Bible says that, uh, whatever you do, do in love and perfect love casts out all fear. So there's so many, uh, good things there, but, uh, so I really appreciate that. I think that's, I think that's important. And we tell guys to out love and outserve their wives and, uh, that's important. So let's go back into this, uh, part three roles and responsibilities, you know, you, you had written on your website that back in the day, we had very clear, defined roles and responsibilities. Now we don't. And so part three in your uh, marriage happiness uh, project is, is about identifying roles and responsibilities. Can you walk us through that? 
Yeah, sure. Basically, in the household, you know, who does what, who takes yes. out the garbage, when do you yep. take out the garbage, you know, so you can like make make this list, like who kids and pets, who walks the dog, who buys food for the dog, who takes the dog to a doctor or like the kids to the doctor, because it's also important. Like if that one person is responsible, let's say somebody has the dog or the kid has to take medicine, that somebody owns this, you know, like oh, did you give it? Uh, now you give, give it double or whatever. And I think this doesn't work. Um, or if I'm, you know, it's once you clearly define who's responsible for what a lot of drama will go away and you know my wife always said like i do everything you do nothing and now i could just like pull out this list saying like no honey i actually do this and this and this and you do this and this and this and we can move stuff around but we have a basis and a foundation of um you know foundation to to talk about stuff um and yeah i think it's also like kind of being appreciated for the things that you do uh also it's like another thing that that's really helpful so do yourself a favor, very simple. Just write down who does what in your relationship. And trust me, it works wonders. You know, it can be, well, can, it can expose that you're not doing shit. shit but yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, what's but, interesting here is this part three is the most pragmatic of all of them because it's really as simple as sitting and down, sitting and writing it down. You know, it's really, really simple. And so really couples should be able to do this fairly easily. Uh, and, and it does shift and change over the, over the seasons of life, but this is really good, man. So, well, Hey, part four, and this is where it gets a little bit more technical is planning and goal setting. And you said in this part, we will plan and set goals for the following areas and you identify five. So I want to, I want to, I want to know why you pick these five. So the five are health, wealth, growth, fun, and relationship. So talk to us about goal setting and why these five. I think these are the most important areas in, in your life. Health, super crucial. Mm -hmm. Wealth, you know. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you run out of money, it's, it's you know, you, you're there to provide. And um, also set, setting certain goals and getting on the same page, you know, like actually once you have a goal, like, hey, we want to buy this house or we want to buy this thing, it becomes, uh, you know, once you have a strong why to save money, it actually becomes much easier, you know, and you're like, less inclined to buy the 20th pair of sneakers or the 20th black dress or whatever, you know? So like, because you have a yeah. why to, you know, it becomes much stronger if you have like a cool emotional why and communicate amongst each other and you can hold each other accountable. That's the power of like, you know, having your partner as an accountability partner to like, you know, to work together on, on a goal that you're setting, right? In terms of growth, I think we always, as I mentioned before, you always have to grow if you, you always want to grow if you if you're not growing then you're on your way out and we, we always yep. the universe expands and we as humans always want to expand because otherwise it's not fun i think you're you if somebody's in the decline decline you're i think you're not happy well yeah, it's really it's really it's really easy when it, speaking of growth it's really easy for a guy who's a businessman or an entrepreneur to grow himself but transferring that growth over to your wife to have a plan. What will we do together to grow and identifying what does my wife need? <clears throat> what does she need from me for her to grow? Where can I help her and where can she help me? So this is really important. I think this is overlooked. Like we don't, we health, we understand, we, we, we understand that wealth, we have to have money. We have to spend it. But I don't, I think where people fall short is this growth area. They just don't know how to transfer their growth experiences to the person they love. Yeah. And especially when, when you grow really fast and you grow apart, you know, we kind of always want to yeah. like level, level up with each other, you know? Yep. And yeah, just like having these regular family meetings once a week, mm -hmm. just like, you know, make, make time with your wife. Don't do it at the end of the day when everybody's tired. Make it a nice thing, like go to yoga together and then have a nice brunch and then talk about the stuff, what's going on in the family, you know, how the kids doing, blah, what, what are mm -hmm. our goals, check in, how we're doing with, with the goals that we've set, check in. Yeah, it's, I think it's it's a, it's a really important habit and practice. Yeah, and, and I, know, I know for me personally, I, I know what I love to do that fills my tank. I know what I love to have fun. But when you're talking about fun here, we had a guy on our podcast years ago, he's now dead now, but he talked about falling in love with what your wife loves. So talk to us about fun and how that works in the mind and the life of an entrepreneur. 
Yeah, that's it's actually a, a a tough thing for me, and it's really oh, I know like that's I, fought, I know it is because <laughs> I'm a one trick pony. I'm just like really enjoy warping. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's like, yeah. And I actually built this course to be a better husband, to be a better father, because I've just like you know really just like focus on work because this is where I get my gratification from. This is you know I think yeah. So um, yeah, falling in love with the, with the things that you are kind of coming up with things, activities that you like, enjoy doing together. Um, yeah. It's just yeah. just a crucial thing, and sometimes it takes some time. You know, my wife, I, I love skiing. I've been skiing since I'm four years old, and my wife didn't like it. She was not good at it. But um, now my daughter also wanted to do it, so we had my ally to um, actually actually make this happen, and it grew on her. You know, sometimes you have to. Do the exposure therapy thing and vice versa you know just like do things <laughs> yeah your wife likes yeah. uh and and i just like try out stuff try out fun stuff you know life life's too short and don't just i think it's important to do stuff just like watch sit sit at home and watch tv on netflix like eh, you know just like plan stuff a friend of mine does something cool he does every other weekend um one saturday or one sunday she plans something and she doesn't tell him like in the mornings so like hey, we're oh. gonna do this because that's actually, you know, you, 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 it's not like, you know, with your wife, okay, let's watch TV. Let's watch a Netflix series. Then you sit down, you click around and you like look at 20 different shows and then you end up staring at your phone or something like this, you know. But if you actually really plan it and somebody has the, um, the role or like accepts, okay, today I will plan it. I'm going to make it cool. It's 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 a different dynamic, you know, and it's really fun actually. So yeah, one day, one Sunday, he plants, and the other Sunday, she plants. I think it's it's a it's an interesting. Yeah, I think that's really good, man. And just learning to like my wife and I got scuba certified together several years ago. Uh, you know, what are the things that we can both do together? I will not let my wife ever be a hunting partner. I won't let her do it. <laughs> I just, that's a, that uh, there's way too much blood and guts and sweat and pain. And, and it's just awesome. But, but one of the things my wife is actually considering is fly fishing. So mm -hmm. I do that. And she's like, I, I want to do that. So we went out and I taught her how to, you know, to cast and these things are important. What, what can we do together? That is fun. That will nurture our relationship. So, so how are, so you have these five areas, health, wealth, growth, fun, and relationship. How is, fun different than relationship in your categorization i mean it's just like fun stuff is, is stuff that you're doing and then relationship is like things are just between you and your wife and it can also be relationships with other people okay you know for example like I organizing you. family dinners or organizing like gatherings or whatever you know it's just kind of an important thing is like figure out what is this for you because you know what i mean as I said before mm -hmm. you gotta mm -hmm. put like the supercar on his vision board don't, you know, don't keep up with the Joneses. Don't do what David does. You know, just like figure out what really makes you too happy, you know, and then figure that out. Yeah, I think that's so I think that's important. There's investing in fun things that will build a relationship, but actually targeting the relationship. What can you do to target the relationship? So that's really good, man. So let's look at part five in your marriage project. And you mentioned this earlier. You, you mentioned uh doing things so you don't have to get into these conflicts. So getting ahead of the conflict before it happens. So the fifth part is problem solving and it's how do you attack problems in your relationship? And I think this is a, a massive issue in my marriage. Personally, uh, we are great at dealing with conflict, but we deal with it like two Tyron Tyrannosaurus Rexes. We just <laughs> attack each other. So, so we've struggled on that end of conflict resolution. Some couples struggle with ignoring conflict. What are, what are your thoughts about problem solving and this thing uh, called conflict resolution? So what works really well for us is if you, we, A, we talk about this at the specific times, you know, like, and we kind of know down if we had a conflict, we know it down what, what, what happened. And then once we're not emotionally invested into this anymore, we have a conversation, That's important. About this, you know, yeah. so you, you're in a solution oriented mindset, because when you're in the middle of a fight, you just want to win. You just, you don't want to have the best outcome for everybody. You just want to win. You totally. either wants to win. Right. Um, but once you're in a solution oriented mindset, similar to work, if your uh, head of revenue is not bringing in the money, like you will not yell at them. You'll say like, hey, dude, what's missing? Like, you know, do you need more marketing budget? Is the marketing guy not performing? Why is sales not there? 
right? So you basically have a solution-oriented discussion. And this is the same thing that I have with my wife, for example. One thing that we, we fix very elegantly is my, my father, you know, I told you before, like he was like super Buddhist hippies, you know? So in yeah. my household, my father always said, if you have to yell, your argument is too weak. You know, I was never touched. Mm. As I always like we when we were fighting, we had a conversation the way you you and I are having a conversation right now. It was like never any negative emotions, right? So, you know, also think that yelling is a form of violence. And my wife, coming from a Turkish family, more uh, emotional, you know, more hot blooded. Um, it's it's normal that they yell at each other from time to time. And um, she was yelling at her daughter, and I didn't want that. And she also doesn't want that, but it's a pattern that she's learned over being brought up you know so it's like just kind of totally different. yep and and every time when she's yelling at emma again and i criticize her about this she blew up even more because she's already in the state of rage and so we come together in a family meetings and we talk about these things and this was like one of the topics like hey yelling at emma how can we fix that and being in our solution oriented mindset we thought okay let's have a safe word so if we're standing in front of some bananas with some spots on it's like okay if i say faule banan which means like rotten bananas in german then you will you get reminded of that, that you actually do not want to yell at Emma and I'm not criticizing her. I'm just giving her this word and it's worked like a charm. So over the next, I think like three, six months, we completely eradicate this. Every time she was yelling at her, we just said, you yell, foul the banana. And then she's like, it's, it stopped. You know, before when I said like, you're yelling at Emma again and she blew up, you know, so being in a solution, solution oriented mindset and when you have your meetings, do not, as I said before, do not do it at the evening when you're burned out. Just do it in a nice setting after you exercise together or whatever, have a nice brunch, and then like talk about this stuff, you know. And um, yeah, once you're in this habit, it's it's it also becomes a normal thing to talk about things you don't like. Same same in business. If you have an error, a failure culture, it's okay to talk about things that went wrong. Uh, without getting emotional about this, you know, then people do not sweep things under the rock and you actually tackle the issues. You know, like if you have a bug in your software, you want to get rid of these bugs, you want to get rid of the bugs in your relationship to make sure you have a cool and fun relationship. Just uh, yeah, get get rid of the bugs, I guess. Yeah, that's I really appreciate that. I think uh once <clears throat> an argument escalates, it's over. But earlier in the podcast, you quoted Stephen Covey. In his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and Covey also talks about the win-win. What is the win-win? That's one of his seven things. Look for the win-win. And so it's hard to get a win-win when you're both angry and, and you're trying to win yourself, win-lose. So I think that's really good, man. And, you know, uh, you know, you said in your on your website, you said, quote, most of the time you only talk about problems when you're fighting. This means you're emotionally blinded. And you only want to win the argument, not solve the problem. So I think getting ahead of that problem or getting behind the problem, uh, allowing yourself to de-escalate so you can deal with it in a uh, mature, and healthy oriented. manner is really yeah. Be solution oriented. Solution oriented, yeah, that's really good, man. So hey, the last thing here, uh, it's kind of the grand finale. And uh, <laughs> man, if a, if a guy didn't go through this, I'd be going, "What's going on?" I already already dealt with wealth, you know, in a step number four, planning and goal setting, but. Uh, your grand finale, part six is finance. Uh, and you said on your website that this is a section where you will show uh, people how to budget and how to do their quarter quarterly net worth tracking. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, sure. So I think um, it's always important to have a budget, you know, because otherwise mm -hmm. you want to spend or at least you want to see like where, where you stand. And yeah. um, even if you make a million a month, if you spend a million and a half a month, you know, it's... You know, just want to budgeting is just an important thing, and I've been always, uh, I never had any debt. My mom, mother hammered this into me, like you know, and also Germans are not we're very good with our money, kind of being frugal. We do not drive uh -huh. a fancy car if we can't afford it. You know, we basically German idea is you buy a car cash, you know, that's kind of like how you do that. Um, so yeah, I think having a budget is 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 crucially important, and net worth tracking. It's it's really overlooked, I think, that yeah, most people it is, do not it is. do not just like focus on like how much cash they have in the bank, but just like an overall like what's my net worth, you know, like the different assets that I have and also kind of be diversified and look at this on on a quarterly basis. How do you where, where are you standing, you know, with um your house, your 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 um your investments, um, your investments, etc. And also, you know, if I get hit by a bus 
it's going to be like super hard for my wife to figure out like where is all where is everything you know so we kind of have like this document where everything is is in there how much is where who are the people she can talk to and you know we have like last pass as a as a way so she can log into the stuff um you know because like it's it's just especially with me i have 10 different companies and it's just like she, she would be terribly lost in case i do not document this and i think it's um my mother did actually my mother passed away nine years ago or so eight nine years ago and she, my father passed away when i was 12 um but my mother did like a phenomenal job like she she had cancer and um she knew that she will be gone soon and she like lined everything up she handed me a document where i kind of everything was specked out it was absolutely mind-blowing how organized she was and this is like something and i also saw the the other the, the other side where somebody passed away it's just like an absolute mess so when i go i do not want to leave a mess behind i want to just like be organized you know hand over you know same when you go on vacation you want like just like hand all the projects over to a colleague you know so same thing i want to be like organized to have clean handover in case i well yeah in your in your business in your business you have it set up to where if you died or one of your main people died you'd have all the passwords and everything carried over uh in our in my life on my on my budget i have every area every investment and how to get a hold of those companies so many people just keep up with the joneses and buy things to impress people they don't like Uh, it's 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 really ludicrous actually i think and in my last business we i was driving my business partner was driving a beat up Mini Cooper and I was driving a smart car and we had employees with Porsches, Mercedes and BMWs. And then we're definitely in a better position than them. And it's just like, I can't wrap my head around why, why people do this. It's just like, yeah. So what do you recommend for a net worth for it? What, what do you recommend as a net worth? Do you have a, a goal when you work with people like, hey, your goal should be this much net worth by 50? I mean, there's this, you know, there's this, uh, what's it called? Um, fat fire. It's like the uh, people on on Reddit that want to basically retire so they not have to work anymore um, uh-huh. and still live like a a certain lifestyle. So I guess you can just like calculate like what lifestyle do you really want? Like how much money do you want in disposable income every month for the rest of your life? And then kind of like if you see like say like eight percent returns or like you know what dividends do your stocks pay? Like then mm-hmm. you figure out like how much do you need to have in the bank? So this basically spits out the money that you want without it going to zero ever you know so you can also pass something on to um your kids another school of thought is that you do not pass anything on to your kids so they will actually grow teeth because like i think it's you know i've seen this a lot that with very wealthy parents that the kids just like have no no drive in life and just like but yeah different topic well i think that's a whole nother interview but you're absolutely right i mean i, I will leave inheritance for my kids but while they're you know, I've always made them work for what they have because I don't want to have soft men because soft men will raise soft children and have soft marriages and soft lives. And so they've had to figure it out on their own. I mean, I help them, I help them intellectually, but it's their job to make it happen. And uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think there is some wisdom to leave an inheritance, but, but it should not be an inheritance that uh, will allow that child to not work anymore. You know, I think you're absolutely right. So, hey, man, David, I really appreciate you coming on. There's some great stuff here. I think this marriage project is excellent. How can our guys get a hold of you or get linked into this marriage project? So you can reach out to me on the David at Hensel.com, David at my last name.com. Uh, you can go to managinghappiness.com. We have a new court going live. We, we kind of like took the course apart and we have a leading course which is a habit course and we're doing a habit challenge which is starting september 6th it's a 30-day habit challenge because you know as we talked about this before habits determine everything in your life and this is the yeah. starting the starting program um for for the managing happiness course and then you can kind of like branch out into the different other courses but it is 30-day habit challenge you put together with four other participants and one alumni coach or like a guide Mm -hmm. and then you learn how to make habits how to break habits and how to stick to them and you have this positive peer pressure of this of this group so check it out managinghappiness.com i appreciate that man so managinghappiness.com guys 
let's get our boots on the ground here. What's next? What action step will you take because of what you heard today? And guys, listen, I, I want you to sit down with your wife, go on a date, get in a nice quiet place and identify one area of your marriage that needs work. Today, you've heard of six different areas that you can grow, uh, managing yourself, part one, which deals with just you managing part two is what do you want your life to look like? In other words, it's building a harmonious relationship. Part three is identifying roles and responsibilities. Part four is planning and goal setting. Plat five, pl- part five, excuse me, is problem solving. How do you attack problems in your relationship? And then part six is dealing with finances and how do you do your budgeting? So guys do that, identify that, hit up, hit David up and it's Henzel. H-E-N-Z-E-L. So in case you're wondering, uh, you can do that. Guys, so David, thanks so much for coming on the show. Really had a great time with you today. And man, it's been a blessing. Thanks for having me. All right. Hey, guys, make sure you head on over to meninarena.org. Guys, grab your free copy of my book. Tell them what great fathers tell their sons and daughters. And make sure you sign up to join one of our many virtual teams by clicking to join our program now. Teams are uh, recruiting right now. We're getting ready to start up for our fall launch here in about a month. So make sure you get on there and join now. We got guys from all over the world jumping on this thing. And guys, we're excited to have you as part of our tribe. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man. You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.